Welcome back. Dr. Hernandez presented the overview of sex offenders in the federal system on day one of the two-day seminar. On the following day, he discussed the specifics of Butner's sex offender treatment program. Today, uh, this uh, first part, I want to talk about the sex offender treatment program. And when I refer to the sex offender treatment program, I am now referring to the residential component of the sex offender treatment program. The SOTP is intended in the future to be a national program that includes several different components. And I'm going to talk about those uh, components this afternoon. This is part of a, uh, a larger proposal that we are working, uh, working on. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, background of the uh, SOTP overview, admission criteria, the referral procedures, and the discharge uh, process. All right, background and philosophy. This program was actually started as a pilot program in 1989, where a few people who the Bureau of Prisons did a, uh, a participated in a work group looking at the need for sex offender treatment in the Bureau of Prisons. At that time, the uh, work group recommended the uh, development of a 24-bed residential sex offender treatment program uh, here in Butner, and it was originally conceived as a 24-bed program. In 1990, this uh, program was uh, uh, formalized and turned into a uh, component of our psychology services. The program uh, lost its uh, director uh, in 1995, I believe, and um, uh, there was a, a period of uh, without, uh, there was an interim director, but I came on board in January of 1997. Uh, since that time, uh, I have made, uh, along with the uh, uh, new staff, uh, considerable changes to the program. Um, and, and what you will hear today, what you have been hearing uh, thus far, uh, reflect the, uh, the, the changes that have been implemented to the program. The program largely remains a cognitive behavioral program within a relapse prevention framework. Our philosophy is this program, being voluntary, is designed to help those who want to help themselves. Now a lot of people say, yes, I want help, I need to change. But they say that at a time that they're actually vulnerable, they're scared, uh, they're afraid uh, that if they don't comply with a judicial recommendation, somehow they're going to be locked up forever, even though there is plenty of information that uh, tells them that, is, that that is not the case. A lot of inmates uh, then who come into the program say, yes, I do want to uh, participate, but we when we actually put the heat on them and uh, put them to task and demand that they change, many of them do not meet those expectations. And few uh, withdraw from the program. Uh, many have to be expelled because of ongoing rigid resistance or just a blatant violation of program rules or BOP rules. This is a program that is task-based. It is not time-based. This is a question that I get all the time. How long is the program and uh, uh, do, uh, uh, how long does an inmate need to complete the program? Well, <clears throat> uh, uh, given the, the premise that treatment is a lifelong endeavor. I don't see a clear beginning or a clear end to treatment. Many individuals have started the change process way before they entered treatment. It may have been when they were put in handcuffs. At that moment, they may have already started the change process. It may have been at sentencing. It may have been when they were put in a bus and transferred to this institution. Uh, or they still may not uh, uh, enter the uh, change process, you know, even after they are into the program or in the program for several months. The end. We don't have a clear end because this is not like a class where you have session number one and then session 16 and then you have your final exam and then it's over. 
I've, I've had inmates who have participated in, the, in other uh, sex offender treatment programs who have stated to me upon entering the programs that, Doc, I've been in treatment before. All I need is some of that victim empathy and some of that uh, cognitive restructuring. <laughs> um, I, I've had, I, I did have a long talk with that inmate to explain to him that that's not the way it works. These are not like college credits that you transfer from one <laughs> institution to, to the other. It is task-based. Inmates are supposed to, program participants, sex offenders are supposed to achieve and maintain certain therapeutic gains. Uh, yesterday, Karen talked about acceptance of responsibility, talked about effective uh, modulation uh, or, or self-regulation of negative affect. She talked about uh, uh, effective application of relapse prevention uh, skills. These are all the tasks that are required of sex offenders. That is how we judge their progress and that is how we judge their program completion. I have met no inmate who has left our program either because he has been expelled or has actually, his sentence has expired and then we have to put them out the door. No inmate that I know of has completed all phases of treatment. It's, it is an ongoing process. I have a, uh, an expectation that every inmate, every program participant will continue in some form of sex offender treatment or aftercare upon release from prison. So in, from my perspective, that doesn't, uh, treatment doesn't end when they are out the door. Now they may have achieved a great deal in their progress. It, that is yet to be determined if they're going to maintain those uh, gains. But again, it is task-based, task not time-based. We've mentioned this before. Cure is not the goal. We don't intend to cure anybody. We certainly try to modify some of their sexual offense, uh, uh, sexual arousal patterns. We try to modify their criminal lifestyle. And uh, we spend a lot of energy and time doing that. But we recognize that these are very, very difficult patterns to break. And for some people, uh, I have concluded that is uh, almost impossible to break. And all we can do is help them help themselves through two dimensions. The external dimension, that is applying conditions externally that reduce the possibility that that individual will reoffend, and also the internal dimension, which is giving that person tools internally, psychological tools that he can use to then reduce his level of risk. So the goal is here self-control. It is not cure. Treatment is long-term. I think I mentioned this uh, before. And sexual deviance is a lifelong problem. It is not something that's going to go away. A lot of uh, program participants have unrealistic expectations, if not magical thinking about, hey, I'm gonna complete the program. Uh, they get into this high because they, they, they have not been uh, encountering any high risk uh, situations. Certainly in prison, they don't have any children to uh, molest and very few uh, stimuli or triggers so they, they get into this high. They have a, a, an illusion of self-control, many of them, and go out and th think, yes, I'm going to make it. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave that uh, life behind, and it's not going to bother me anymore. I'll just get an adult-appropriate relationship, and my life will be fine and dandy. Well, that's not the way it usually works. They'll be confronted with multiple, multiple sexual risk factors. We're going to be confronted at every step of the way. If you have an inmate, a uh, supervisee, who tells you, no, I've been fine, I, I haven't been bothered by triggers, uh, sexual risk factors, they, they are really fooling themselves and being blind to those uh, factors. This also has some uh, implications for policy uh, decisions. I was talking to um, an officer this morning about uh, the uh, gross inadequacy of three to five years of supervised uh, release. Uh, 
and, and certainly that's not your fault. It's, it's, you know, it's everybody's uh, fault for, for thinking that that is adequate. It is, it is by far not adequate at all. When we look at recidivism data, sex, offender, uh, sex offenders actually do quite well three to five years uh, post-release. Recidivism uh, rates are low. But as you get closer to 10 years, and as you get closer to 15 years post-release, those uh, recidivism rates skyrocket. They literally go up like that. So to me, that suggests that we need to modify our policies. Sexual deviance doesn't stop you know, three, three to five years after release. Now, there are some jurisdictions that are being very proactive and have recognized this problem and have also recognized the inadequacy of other interventions like civil commitment and how expensive that is and have looked at alternatives like lifetime supervision and probation. All right, let me give you a, a little overview of the program. Every inmate who comes into the program has been uh, pre-screened. I have looked at the... Uh, uh, PSI, I have looked at collateral information. Uh, they have met the admission criteria. But they, they still go through an assessment period. This assessment period is to do an offender-specific uh, evaluation and to determine whether or not they're going to be suitable for the program. In about two to three months, we will know if this person is a psychopath who will disrupt the program and needs to be immediately removed uh, from the program, in two to three months we will know if this individual will really come to terms with his sexual behavior problem and really work on what he needs to work. In two to three months we have a very good understanding of the offender. We have multiple sources of information, multiple interviews, behavioral observations, we know if that individual will be responsible. We search their cells. We find out whether or not they continue in irresponsible behavior, whether they collect pornography, uh, whether they uh, collect uh, sexually explicit materials, whether they write letters uh, to uh, children. Uh, we have a good opportunity to look at their entire behavior. The assessment phase is typically 60 days long, and uh, that, that may uh, vary plus or minus, uh, more like plus 30 days. Um, at that point in time, we will know if that person um, will make a good treatment candidate. Now, for the most part, nine out of 10 times, that person will be put in the treatment phase of the program. Uh, it is seldom that an individual doesn't make it and has to be removed from the program after the assessment phase. The treatment phase, and I have a, a uh, program description in your handout uh, packet that describes the program. The treatment phase is comprised of group psychotherapy. Currently, we are offering, we place uh, inmates in groups of about eight or nine with a co-therapy team. That particular group meets three times a week. In addition to that, uh, the inmates receive approximately one hour uh, per week or one hour every two weeks. There may be times that uh, that uh, may be reduced to 30 minutes, and we try to gauge the uh, individual's uh, needs for additional treatment or less treatment. In addition to the group and individual psychotherapy, we also offer the inmate uh, opportunities to obtain some skills and in information through psychoeducational programming. Psychoeducational programming may be, uh, the topics may include relapse prevention, may include uh, community building, uh, therapeutic community. It may include anger management. Uh, we are currently doing a comprehensive uh, program on stress management. Uh, again, how are these uh, components uh, uh, related? Well, if, if we just offer them a stress management program outside of the context of a therapeutic process, and this question was raised uh, yesterday, it's, it's rather meaningless. What we try to do is make that stress management program very meaningful and tie it to their individual needs. Karen yesterday mentioned that many of the precursors to offending behavior have to do with uh, 
uh, uh, ineffective modulation of negative affect to include boredom, depression, and anger. So if these people, when either they are bored, depressed, or angry, they tend to act out in inappropriate sexual ways more than not, uh, more than I other times, then we need to give them alternatives or give them tools to manage their boredom, their anger, and their depression in more effective ways. That's how we tie psychoeducational programming to their group psychotherapy, to their individual psychotherapy. I have seen too many programs that simply put them through the machina programs, the, the curriculum, without making meaningful, individualized connections to their sexual behavior problem. Therapeutic community. I mentioned this um, yesterday. All inmates who participate in the program reside in one unit. At this point, it's not the complete unit. Uh, in the future, we will have a complete unit. But they reside in two uh, wings. Now, general population inmates are not allowed in those uh, wings. So it gives the inmates um, some relative privacy to be in common areas, continue in dialogue, in therapeutic dialogue, uh, without uh, fear of being overheard by general population inmates. This, is, this type of dialogue, this type of activity and investment in the uh, therapeutic community is strongly, strongly urged by uh, treatment staff. Inmates who participate in the program have to adhere to a higher standard of conduct. They have to, number one, um, although this uh, changed uh, not too long ago, uh, well, up until a few months ago, inmates could obtain pornographic publications, commercially available pornography. That all changed. However, whatever pornography they have, they can still keep. Um, they cannot receive any new uh, publications. Now, ever since I've I, uh, been with the program, I, I have had a very uh, rigid stance on, uh, on, on the use, possession, of pornography by SOTP inmates. And it's not just pornography. It is anything, whether it's pictorial or in the form of written literature, that depicts sexual exploitation of children, women, adults, dogs, animals, whatever it is. Anything that encourages sexual violence, it is prohibited. That's why we don't just look for, when we search a cell, we just don't look for um, obvious porno uh, pornographic uh, magazines. We search through letters. We search through everything. Uh, these people are quite good at uh, creating their own sexually explicit materials. And they will do so with the Sunday newspaper, with the ads depicting children in swimwear, uh, with the Sears catalog, with uh, uh, catalogs that uh, are sent into the institution and are not of a pornographic uh, nature. They will cut them up and create pornography, sexually explicit materials that they will use to further their sexual deviance, their sexual arousal patterns. And that is something that SOTP inmates are held, held accountable to. I've had inmates who have uh, who are gifted artists, and instead of using their art and their artistic skills to do something productive, they actually draw uh, pornography. Adults having sex with uh, children, or I should say adults sexually abusing uh, children. Very unacceptable, and uh, that's when you really discover whether an inmate is really committed to the process of treatment. I talked about three values, and, I talk, and, and certainly I could talk more about uh, values. My, my stance is these people have a problem not only with their sexual behavior, but they have a problem with their lifestyle. Their lifestyle is one of uh, criminality. Their lifestyle is one of deception, one of dishonesty, manipulation, use and abuse of people. And they need to change that. They need to change that from the ground up. It, it, the, the metaphor that I use is, you know, if you have a, a, a house that needs to be remodeled, 
you can't just remodel the house without looking at the foundation. And if the foundation is cracked, and what I, I tell them, yours is cracked, you just need to look at the cracks. You need to tear down the, that entire foundation and start from the ground up. And that means you need to uh, anchor your life to values. And these are the pillars on which the, uh, their house, whatever therapeutic work they do, uh, on which it, it rests. These values, again, are responsibility in all aspects of their lives. So they can't just be responsible with us. Uh, they can't just be respectful with us. They need to be responsible, respectful, tolerant, honest with everyone. The correctional office, officer, their teacher, their food service foreman, everyone. And failure to do, uh, to do so is when we come in and reflect that back to them and say, well, this is what you're not doing. You say you want to change. You say you want to be responsible. You say that you are an honest person. And let me show you how you're not. So what decision are you going to make? That's what that means. And there is a, a great deal of pressure, peer pressure, to uh, live up to these expectations and live up to the changes that they say they're going to make. The final phase of treatment, and this may begin uh, when they first come in. We may need to, uh, we start looking at some of these uh, issues when they first come in. That may have to do with uh, their release plans, particularly if it involves uh, an inappropriate release residence where there, is, uh, may, may, there may be substance abuse, there may be uh, children at risk, um, or what we uh, term enablers, people who will not be adequate monitors of behavior. In the final phase of, of, of treatment, what we do is we do risk assessment, and we'll talk about how risk assessment is done. This is a, 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 a prediction of future behavior. It is a way to categorize or place along a, a continuum of risk an offender, and this is done for your benefit. I think that you need to know if you're getting a high-risk offender, a very high-risk offender, like the one we released uh, you know, recently, or if you have a low-risk offender, a person who, by every indication, is likely not to reoffend given certain parameters, if uh, he's kept away from these uh, sources, uh, sources of stimulation. Um, but you also need to know if you have a high-risk offender and with our suggestions on how that person ought to be supervised and how you ought to interpret their, their behavior. Um, that, that, that's very critical. So we do the uh, risk assessment and then communication with the uh, PO. What we do is prepare a discharge report. In this uh, discharge report, we're going to summarize the course of treatment. We're also going to provide you with a formal risk assessment. And then we're going to recommend, in addition to the standard conditions of supervised release, special conditions or risk contingent release recommendations. Now, we're not going to go overboard. We're, try, we're, trying, uh, we're going to try to meet with the recommendations the risk that the offender presents to the community or to the community that he is releasing to. We may have some problems here, and we need to work on how to make this uh, communication more effective. If the uh, individual, if the offender is getting released from prison at the same time that he's being discharged from the SOTP, we, the staff of the SOTP, will take it upon ourselves to call the probation officer and forward that report. We have tried to work with our case manager, the, the case manager that works with us, to place that packet in the central file, which is, which is the, the most official chart or charting system in our, in, in our uh, agency. 
We place two nodes. We place the uh, discharge packet in the what we call the FOI section, the Freedom of Information Act section. Those are the exempt documents that inmates uh, do not uh, see. And then we place another cover memorandum on Section 5. Section 5 of the central file prompts the case manager, whoever the case manager is, to send information to the probation officer upon the inmate's release from custody. So that memorandum compels the case manager to look in the FOI section and really take that packet and release it to you. That's where we may have a problem because I cannot control what other case managers do. I have an influence on what uh, case managers at these institutions do. But let's say an inmate who gets discharged and has another, uh, say, two years to go, goes over to the low security institution or goes to FCI Wasika in Minnesota, I have no way of controlling what that case manager does. Hopefully in the future we can develop some policies and some safeguards that uh, compel case managers to send the information out to you. In the meantime, it, take a, it will take some proactive action on your part to find out if the inmate participated in the sex offender treatment program and where to get that information. Now, we will be more than happy to forward that information to you directly. But once the inmate leaves the program, we have like too many inmates to keep track of. But if you give us a call, we also have duplicate records of those uh, discharge packet, uh, packets. And we'll be more than happy to release that to you uh, as soon as you need them. Okay? Um, so I'm recognizing that we do have a problem with dissemination of information. But I also want to let you know that the information is available to you uh, through us and also by prompting the case manager because that information ought to be in the central file. <coughs> Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. What about sharing the information with um, treatment providers? By all means. This is a report that is intended to be used by the probation officer. It is intended to be used by um, the uh, treatment pro uh, provider who will see them in aftercare. And in some cases, it may be appropriate for certain other individuals to look at that report, such as a family member, say a spouse. It may be very important for that person to be either fully briefed or have that person read that report. Now, all of these offenders have signed, anyone who comes into the program, have, uh, they have signed uh, waivers of confidentiality, where we can release, the, uh, release this information to you. Uh, to treatment providers uh, as deemed uh, necessary and to others as deemed necessary either by us or by you. So it's not necessary for us to <coughs> execute release of information we can? Uh, no. Yes, ma'am. Is a copy of that release included in, in the packet or with the discharge report so that we could have it or can it be? I can make that available to you. It, it is uh, described in the uh, discharge report um, in the form of a narrative. Um, it says uh, the inmate signed a consent of information agreeing to blah, blah, blah. Um, now, we can also provide you with a signed copy of that. Uh, in, in, uh, in many uh, discharge packets, we have actually included a copy of the uh, uh, consent form. Yes, ma'am. I get a lot of calls from the field um, telling me that institutions are not releasing information without a consent. And I, and I talked to Vicki Verdine about this in Washington, and she indicated that we're a need-to-know um, group, so we don't need a consent. And I thought it would be helpful for people to know that, that when you get that response from the VOP, to let them know that we are a need-to-know um, group, and we don't need a, a, a release. And that's in, your, in their policy. Correct. So. Okay. Let me uh, talk about admission criteria. I, I, I talked to uh, many of you, many other probation officers, about what, is, uh, the, uh, what are the uh, criteria for admission. Number one, he's a sex offender. Now, he may be a sex offender because he says uh, uh, he's a sex offender and, and admits to having a sexual behavior problem, a significant sexual uh, behavior problem. 
or he has been convicted of a sexual crime. And yes, child pornographers are sex offenders, and I, I get that question a lot. I, I don't think there is any uh, doubt in your minds, but uh, still there is some uh, doubt uh, in, in other people's minds uh, whether child pornographers are true sex offenders and do, then, uh, do they uh, qualify for the sex offender treatment program. And yes, they do. The inmate volunteers for treatment. And uh, this is a very important consideration because I've had inmates who show up here at this institution recommended by the court. They meet all the uh, admission criteria and they say to me, well, doc, you know, I, if this is a voluntary program, I don't really want to do it. I want to go back to uh, Oklahoma or I want to go back to wherever, uh, wherever he came from. Uh, I never volunteered uh, f for the program. I thought the judge ordered me into the uh, program. So and we have to then not admit that uh, inmate and we'll see if we can send him back. He's between 18 and 36 months from his projected release date. That's what PRD means. So that includes good conduct time. But there is a considerable waiting list for the program. And although an inmate with an 18-month uh, sentence would be eligible for the program, I don't have a bed for that person right now. That person would have to wait a good 12 months, a whole year on the waiting list before I can admit that individual. So really to be placed on the waiting list and have a good chance of getting into the program at this point in time with only 36 beds, that individual needs to be closer to the 36 month <coughs> marker, probably no less than 33 months. Now, can the individual be referred to the program with a longer sentence, more than 36 months? Yes. If he has a 50-month uh, sentence, a 78-month uh, uh, sentence, yes, they can refer the uh, inmate. I'll place that inmate on the waiting list. He can be designated to an institution uh, commensurate with his security level, hopefully closer to his home. And then at the time that, uh, that he's getting closer to 36 months, I will look at uh, space availability and then prompt that institution, that case manager, to then submit a redesignation request for the sex offender treatment program. And that's how we can get the inmate into the program. Yes, ma'am. Approximately how long does a person stay in the program once you do get them into the residential program? Our intention is to treat that individual until his data release. So they would stay in the program until they are released from custody. The reason for that is because that is how we maximize our limited resources. We aim to treat those individuals who will inevitably be released to the community. Because those are the individuals who will need it the most. I am not going to treat a person who has a 15 year sentence before a person who has a 24 month sentence. But say you have someone that's a 24 month sentence and they're on the waiting list for 12 or even 18 months, would you still put them in the residential program for the last six months even though there's a small amount of time left? The answer to that at this point in time is no. I would say to that referral uh, person, look, by the time they get through the waiting list, I am not going to be able to place that individual in the program. He will not even have close to 18 months left. Now, if the person, you know, after doing all the math, will have, say, uh, you know, 16 months or 15 months left uh, in, uh, in custody, yes, I will admit that person into the program. This is, this is one of the uh, problems that we're currently facing, but we're also currently in the process of uh, trying to remedy. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, before that we, we do expect that uh, the sex offender treatment program will be expanded significantly uh, come August probably to be implemented at some time in October or a few months uh, thereafter, uh, tripling the uh, bed capacity. That will uh, solve the problem of individuals who have 18 month or 20 month, uh, 21 month uh, sentence and cannot get into the program even though they meet all the eligibility criteria. There was another question. Yes, ma'am. For pre-sentence writers, when we are, I guess, advising the courts of recommendations about the custody period to put 
put in there that they be referred for SOTP treatment at the appropriate time or something to flag that case so it won't fall through the cracks. My, my recommendation is, is, is uh, for the court to be very specific about the language uh, used in the judgment and commitment order. Specific referral to the sex offender treatment program at FCI Butner, review for uh, admission uh, criteria. Uh, it might even say something about uh, and, and inform the court whether the uh, 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 judicial recommendation uh, was uh, followed. So whatever level of specificity you want to uh, uh, determine, the, the, the clearer of a response that you will get. What I don't recommend is that uh, the judicial recommendation read as uh, recommended to Butner for treatment. It should say recommended for the sex offender treatment program at FCI Butner. Yes, ma'am. Will that help place that person ahead of someone who possibly has already been there on the waiting list but did not have that specific order? No. It will um, hopefully ensure that I get the referral. That's what it, it, it ensures, and I will review the referral. All admissions to the uh, sex offender treatment program go through me. So if I don't review the referral, it never happened. If I don't have any paperwork on that uh, inmate, it, it was never referred. Um, the only way in which uh, the, the case managers are compelled to make that referral if they see on the judgment and commitment order, this is what the judge wants. At that point, they will look up the policy, and the policy says the director of the SOTP must review all referrals, and then they will forward the information to me. I will review it and respond, uh, respond back to them uh, in, in formal communications. All right. Uh, has no pending charges or detainers. Now, if our aim is to treat individuals who will be released to the community because that is what uh, the effect of treatment is supposed to aid that individual in the community. So if that individual has a detainer to go do another 10 or 15 years in, this, in the state of Maryland, it doesn't really uh, make a whole lot of sense to treat that person when I have another individual who will hit the streets way before that other person will. So pending charges that may interfere with release to the community or actual detainers lodged by other jurisdictions may preclude admission to the program. It is not an automatic. Uh, detainers may be in the form of uh, concurrent charges uh, uh, or a sentence. Uh, detainers may not be significant. If they have to go do another six months in state uh, custody, well, that's not significant, uh, especially if they're not going to be able to obtain sex offender treatment in that uh, uh, state jurisdiction or correctional system. The person is not psychotic and that is floridly psychotic or psychologically unstable. If, if that's the case, that person needs to be psychologically stabilized before they come into the program. He is literate and not mentally retarded. We, we take people who are even of, uh, low, uh, in the low average intelligence and some in the borderline uh, range of intelligence, but if they're mentally retarded, we're really not equipped. Uh, we, we have not made the modifications to the program to accommodate uh, these people. And the individual is not a sadist and or a florid psychopath. Uh, this is a career criminal, a person who is uh, cold, calculating, callous, has no, absolutely no empathy for others or a sadist. Uh, sadists are not good for these type of treatment programs. They actually enjoy quite a bit the retelling of their stories and they enjoy uh, hearing other people's uh, stories. Sadists uh, need to be managed in a different way and for this uh, particular treatment program that would be a, a contraindication. Or the person is not a chronic uh, treatment failure. I've, I've seen it too many times where the person has already been failed out of two treatment programs or has reoffended while in treatment. Um, and my, my response to the uh, referral is, well, what's different now? You know, he has a proven history of not taking advantage of these opportunities, these uh, privileges, and more treatment is not likely to do any, uh, any better. 
Okay, the referral process, I, I've talked about direct commitment, the court makes a recommendation, CCM uh, office uh, makes the uh, referral to me, then I approve the uh, admission uh, either immediate or to the waiting list, and then the inmate is designated by the regional director. If it's a redesignation from other BOP institutions, it it's, uh, follows a similar um, a process, the unit team or psychologist makes a referral. Uh, I review that referral. I either accept it for immediate admission or to the pl uh, placement on the waiting list. And then the regional director redesignates that inmate. All right, I think I've talked about this uh, discharge. There are two ways of discharging uh, inmates. One is uh, upon release from custody, and this is the traditional he completed treatment, although they never complete treatment. Um, the SOTP mails a copy of the discharge packet to the uh, probation officer or early discharge to program expulsion. Again, that should be the case manager mails a copy of the discharge report. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. How frequently is someone expelled? How frequently? Rather frequently. Um, there are many who come in, many who don't make it. Um, in any case, I don't consider the uh, uh, expulsions uh, failures, either for ourselves or for you, uh, the consumers of our uh, services, because in any case, whether the person makes it to the end or is expelled, uh, expelled uh, uh, prematurely, you will still get a copy of a discharge report that is intended to help you supervise that inmate, uh, that supervisee, in more effective ways. Um, so to me, I'm, I'm still providing a service to, to all of you. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, what are some of the, or can you give us examples of what are the reasons why they're being expelled? Chronic resistance to therapeutic intervention, or that is failure to change. And, and this is chronic. So this is not just one day uh, I'm having a bad day and they blink the wrong way and I kick them out of the program. This is repeated observations of behavior that has been highlighted for the inmate over and over again. He has been offered multiple suggestions. Uh, there have been multiple interventions, sometimes switching treatment staff and treatment approaches. And given their chronic failure to adhere to uh, the treatment plan, that's when they're discharged. They always know it's coming. Um, uh, other examples, uh, failure to uh, adhere to certain policies. If they assault anybody, they're out of the program. They know not to assault anybody. Um, possession of pornography, that's a very good one. Uh, any type of uh, violation that significantly disrupts the program or the security of inmates by disclosing, let's say, confidential or personal information to GP uh, inmates. Uh, these are all grounds for immediate expulsion. Now, there is a, a, a rather cumbersome review process. We don't just say we're going to kick that person out. We've talked about it several, several times before we actually do it. Uh, yes, ma'am, and then I'll get you, sir. Is, once it's fault, it's failed, does that mean that they can't, you know, maybe six months later or a year later, if they have a, uh, a change of heart or, or motivated, can they get back to the program? Once, uh, the question is, once expelled, can they return to the program? And the answer to that is no. And they know that, and every inmate who comes into the program knows that. Because if, if, I, if I made one exception, then that would lend itself to having people be kicked out and then readmitted. And they, they know that this is a unique opportunity that we are investing a great deal of ourselves into, the, uh, into their treatment. And if they waste their chances, this is not their first chance. This is not their second chance. It's probably their 50th chance. And that's what they fail to understand. Many of these individuals, believe in the, uh, in the perpetual second chance. They always think they're getting a, or they should deserve a second chance. They just fail to understand that they're probably in their 50th or 80th second chance. So we, we try to clarify that for them. Sir. If you have a court order and the judge recommends 
person have sex offender treatment at Butner. All this can be sabotaged by the inmate just saying, I don't want to be involved. Absolutely. Uh, the, the question is, uh, even with a strong judicial recommendation for treatment, the inmate can sabotage the entire recommendation by saying, showing up to the treatment program and saying, look, I don't want any treatment. Uh, I don't uh, have a sexual behavior problem. I'm not a sex offender. I don't want your treatment. Yes, that can happen. And that's why I, I uh, try to advocate for sentences to be fashioned after the conduct, not the possibility of future treatment. Because let's say a person will get a sentence, a reduction in sentence because he intends to participate in treatment. There is no guarantee that that person will actually comply with uh, that recommendation. One more question, and, and I think we need to take a break, uh, and I'll entertain more questions uh, uh, certainly in, uh, during the break. Yes, ma'am. Have you done any follow-up on re-arrest rates if people have completed the program? The question is, uh, have we done any follow-up of re-arrest rates uh, on, uh, on individuals that we have released? The Office of Research in, uh, in, in, in our agency did a, a brief uh, study of inmates who were released from, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess from, the, uh, from 1990 up to 1997. When I came in, the study, the data collection stopped. Now, they looked at a control group and they looked at an uh, experimental group, uh, a group of individuals who received SOTP services. They found no significant differences in arrests. The overall recidivism rates for both groups was very low. Now, there are some um, uh, experimental design problems uh, with, uh, with that particular study. Uh, so I wouldn't place too much emphasis on those uh, findings. Uh, one of the problems by design is the length of follow-up. They were followed uh, anywhere from 18 to 36 months. And as I've said before, most sex offenders tend not to reoffend during that period. They tend to reoffend in subsequent years. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Steinauer, and I have been working with the Bureau of Prisons since 1995. Uh, I've been with the Sex Offender Treatment Program since 1997. What I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon are the acceptable standards for assessment and tre treatment of sex offenders. As you probably know from many of your interactions with providers in the field, uh, there, there's a whole variety of educational and professional experiences among those providers quite diverse. What we have found is that a multidisciplinary approach to treatment and to management of sex offenders is the approach that works best. Um, the reason for that is that no one player uh, plays the most significant role. Uh, everyone's working together. You have all these different vantage points from which to observe the behavior uh, and the approach of the sex offender to his lifestyle. Um, and, and working together seems to really help each other out in managing that sex offender in the community. The purpose of this presentation is to assist you in becoming better consumers of mental health professional contracts in the field. And what do I mean by that exactly? Uh, many of you will get sex offenders in the community uh, for whom treatment will be required. Uh, and, and when you get that person, uh, you're going to be looking for someone who can uh, assist that individual through a treatment program out in the community. There aren't a lot of programs available. Um, of the ones that are available, there are some that are actually fairly questionable. Uh, what I'm going to go over today are some of the standards that are expected uh, of good providers in the community. And they are only guidelines, by the way, because uh, universities um, and uh, other kinds of uh, training programs are of short supply, um, university certification programs, that is. Uh, basically, you, you'll have a number of individuals who will not meet the criteria that I'm going to go over. And, and I would not encourage you to um, be overly wary if you feel you have someone who has done a, an excellent job with uh, treatment of sex offenders in the past, even if they do not meet the criteria I'm going to mention. 
uh, I would still encourage you to look at that person in a, in a very broad kind of way because some of the uh, training experiences and, and professional experiences are in small supply. Uh, at the same time, I do want to um, suggest to you what the optimal type of experience, professional experience and educational background would be for providers of sex offender treatment. How many of you are familiar with ATSA? Okay, good, many. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, ATSA stands for the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. They're, the organization's home base is in Beaverton, Oregon, and they're dedicated basically to de developing, disseminating information about research, evaluation, and treatment of sex offenders. Uh, they get that information out to their membership, and all members of ATSA are committed to abiding by certain standards of ethical practices um, or codes as we call them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about them right now. Uh, just for your information though, ATSA does have a website. That website is www.atsa.com. Uh, they have a lot of good information, some of which you have in your packets this after, for this conference. Um, and they're, they're constantly updating it. There are a lot of uh, discussions that uh, take place online um, regarding uh, recent research in the field, certain program practices. Uh, there are a lot of people who go onto the chat lines in order to get information about how they might approach a given problem for a sex offender. Um, and I would really encourage you to become familiar with that uh, website. Okay, what are the standards outlined by ATSA for providers of sex offender treatment? Uh, education must have an advanced degree. What does that degree need to be in? Basically, uh, you, you look mostly at psychology, sociology, human sexuality, social work, uh, criminology, counseling, and psychiatry. They are the primary fields of study in which someone will have an advanced degree. The bare minimum would be a bachelor's degree with a demonstrated uh, level of experience under a licensed professional. Okay, so you want basically an advanced degree preferably uh, or a minimum of a bachelor's degree with a lot of experience under a licensed professional. What about that experience? Basically looking for about 2,000 hours of face-to-face -face contact with sex offenders. That's a lot of time. If you think about it, it's approximately one full year of contact. That's 40 hours a week for 50 weeks of the year, two weeks of vacation. That's a lot of time with sex offenders. That's really what it takes to get a real good sense of what the population is about in, in a very detailed and broad context kind of way. It does not necessarily mean, however, as I mentioned before, that everyone who will be considered a good provider of services in the community will have that much contact. That is the optimal amount of contact. And finally, we're looking for individuals who stay current in the field, uh, reading uh, the current literature, keeping themselves up to date on research and practices, and are willing to invest that amount of time to make sure they're aware of the uh, nuances of working with this particular population. It is a very unique population. Uh, again, I want to mention these are only guidelines. Use your gut instinct as well as grounded in, in the context of the information that you, you have from your own experience as well as from anything you might learn uh, during this conference. Uh, the most important thing I would like you to remember though is that uh, sex offender treatment as a unique area of practice is something that you really can't dabble in. If you have someone who does well a little bit of that and a little bit of that and then oh yes I see five sex offenders a week uh, for sex offender treatment and they're being seen in individual therapy. There's not an infrastructure present for that treatment. Uh, I would really take a second look at that provider as one uh, that you might not want to have uh, as a contract employee with um, the work you do with sex offenders. Any questions about that? Yes. I've seen a lot of the sex offender treatment providers moving into anger management. Is that seen as a similar type of treatment process or is that dabbling then? Uh, in that situation, I, I would say that certainly anger plays a big part in many of the 
uh, behavioral patterns of sex offenders as a population. It does not play a part in all um, uh, sex offenders in the, in the population for sure, but for many it is a very important component in that process of, of behavior. Um, is that relevant? Um, certainly someone who's doing sex offender treatment work may be very skilled in working with anger management and, and in that it does apply to the population to some extent that's reasonable. But again, the, the most important thing we're looking for is, is someone who is, is uh, well grounded in the field knowledge-wise uh, in terms of research um, and is uh, providing a certain structure that you can see as uh, a full program not just individual therapy. I mean, we want to look for someone, I'm going to go into some of this in a minute, someone who um, also will provide group therapy, has contact with the courts, has contact with probation officers, and has really laid the groundwork for a very um, comprehensive intensive program, as opposed to just a little bit of that kind of work. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we have, uh, for example, evaluations that we review from neuropsychologists whose primary practice is neuropsychology. And uh, they will test and evaluate a sex offender, and they have probably, uh, I've been in court with them, and they ask the typical questions. So, Dr. So-and-so, how many sex offenders have you evaluated? Well, and they say, well, six. Well, that, that's, that, that's what we mean. That's dabbling in sex offender treatment, sex offender evaluation, and we caution you against those uh, providers. Um, we don't mean to imply that a uh, sex offender treatment provider ought uh, to not treat other uh, groups. Uh, certainly, I'm, I feel qualified uh, to treat uh, depre uh, depressed uh, individuals. I have uh, worked uh, with families, with uh, children, but I make it my, my uh, practice to specialize in a field because it's, it's hard enough to keep up with the field with one field, let alone several fields. So I feel more competent if I stay within a general area of practice. Domestic violence uh, is, is certainly not uh, incongruent with a person who also specializes in sex offender treatment. I see a great deal of overlap. Um, it, it's just a word of caution. Uh, that's what we want to uh, highlight. Okay, what are some of the more important principles underlying the standards of assessment and treatment? First and foremost, and the reason we even exist, community safety takes precedence over any other considerations. Uh, when I first started doing this kind of work and someone out in the community would ask me, what do you do out in that prison? I would say, well, I'm actually involved in sex offender treatment. What? Sex offender treatment, why would you waste your time on them? How can you do that kind of work? I'm sure many of you have gotten similar uh, responses from individuals as you've talked with them in the community. Well, basically, we're looking at community safety. We're looking at protecting children. If we can work with one offender who has made a difference in his life to the extent that he no longer will hurt a child, you may actually, especially given the statistics that we were talking about earlier, have saved perhaps 100 children from that abuse from that person. Okay, so community safety takes precedence over any conflicting considerations. What else do I mean by that? Uh, basically, an individual, just to give you an example, family reuni reunification. Someone is in the treatment program, is going back to the community, has done really well in the treatment program. Uh, started out, you know, kind of shaky start, had a lot of DUIs, a lot of alcohol problems. Um, really wasn't fully committed in the beginning to doing the work he was needing to do. Uh, got put on probation once while in the program and eventually turned things around, worked really hard, um, earned that opportunity to be back out in that community again. Did a really, really good job. I actually was feeling pretty good about the possibility of his returning to his family. His victims were not actually in his immediate family. They were um, in distant family members' homes, uh, nieces and nephews. Um, but, you know, at the same time, even though I felt like he might be ready to manage that, the reality is that we want to make sure that he's ready before any family reunification takes place. So for him, 
even though for him, I would have liked for him to go back to his, his family, uh, I had to think of his children. Is he really ready? What were some of the things that got him sidetracked initially in the program? Well, there were things like um, you know, the lifestyle he had led before of not really paying attention to deadlines, responsibilities, things that he needed to do on a day-to-day -day basis. He would miss an appointment here and there, for example. Or he'd sleep late because, well, he didn't have an alarm clock. He needed to know that there are certain things he needed to be able to manage well in order for him to earn that right to ultimately go back with his family. And we wanted to give him the best shot at making it back to his family. Well, the best shot means when he gets out there and he's working with one of you, um, that he is getting his feet solidly on the ground in other ways. He's going to be able to provide an income for his family, which means a job, which means get up early in the morning, get to work, and do that consistently. He, he needs to show that he's not going to go back to drinking. He needs to show that he can manage some time with his children while supervised and not get angry with them over the least little thing. So in that case, not only is uh, the safety of the community taking precedence, but we're really seeing that as a benefit to the offender as well. Uh, another way of, uh, I guess, uh, saying this, you know, I've heard it before, is the client is the community, or the community is the uh, client. Um, so I may be treating, we may be treating an offender, an individual, but that individual may not be my primary client. In fact, it may be the community at large, it may be his family, it may be the children or potential victims that he in the future may have contact uh, with. So another way of saying it is the client is uh, the community or the community is the uh, client. Okay, one of the other important principles underlying the standards of assessment and treatment uh, is that there is no known cure. We do not contend that individuals leaving our program are cured. Uh, someone had asked this question earlier. If that's the case, then why are we putting all this money into uh, treatment, all this time and energy? Um, and it's because we basically know that some offenders will change to the extent that they can manage their sexual deviance. They may still have a fantasy that comes to mind from time to time, but they've developed tools on how to not reinforce that fantasy and move further along that continuum of uh, escalation and uh, additional perpetration. Okay, yes. With uh, Dr. Hernandez's issue about the community being a client, when you all do the pre-release or release and you do have an individual who is a sex offender uh, going back to the family, do you do any kind of work with the family project, that person going back to their family? We have some contact with some family members. We do not uh, work with all family members, uh, or all families for that matter, in regard to where an individual is in his treatment and what will need to happen in the home. We do work with that offender during the course of his treatment in his being uh, honest and forthright with his family members about what he has done and what that means and how that will affect uh, his returning to the community. Uh, certain things that will need to be in place. The inmate will put together a very thorough relapse prevention plan that he will write, um, and it will highlight all kinds of uh, details about his offense patterns and his arousal patterns, um, and will uh, identify certain high-risk situations that he will need to avoid at all costs when he's out there, that sort of thing. In regard to um, U.S. probation. We actually have a lot of contact with U.S. probation. I was telling someone earlier today, it's one of the favorite parts of my job. I'm not just saying that because all of you are here. Um, there are a lot of really good questions that come from you um, as we're looking at releasing someone to the community. Um, we've had uh, excellent uh, feedback on what might be available in that particular community, and we've been able to work with uh, USPO's to identify certain needs that a given offender would really need to have. Some that you know, they could do without would be preferable to have them, but certainly those that we, f we find essential for that person's making a good uh, transition into the community. We've even uh, had the opportunity in some cases to 
uh, help with the modification of conditions of supervised release by asking the probation officer to send us that, what is it, a 52 or something? I can't remember the, the, number, the number of that form. But getting the, because we have trust that's built up in that therapeutic relationship, we can work with that offender who says he really wants to change and has really worked hard on changing to get him to see that, you know, it doesn't stop when you go out, out the door. You really need to continue that into the community. So how can you best do that? Agree to certain modifications of the conditions of supervised release. So we'll get him to sign it while they're in there, and then we'll send that to the probation officer actually before they get there. Um, and so certain things are already in place before they set foot out our door. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention you. today. We thank Dr. Hernandez and all the folks at FCI Butner for making this seminar so worthwhile. A great deal of thanks also goes to all of our participants. Their questions and comments throughout the seminar truly enrich the learning experience for everyone. And we have an update as to the status of the sex offender treatment program. In the training, Dr. Hernandez mentioned a proposal to expand the unit from 36 beds to 112. Well, as of November 2000, the sex offender treatment program nearly doubled in size, expanding to 66 beds. In December, they will be in the process of expanding and moving the unit to a 112 bed area. Please remember to fill out your evaluations and rosters and fax them back to us. We really need your feedback to help us design future programs. And remember to check your FJTN bulletin for part two of this special needs offender series, the Sex Offender Treatment Program at FCI Butner. I'm Mark Maggio. Thank you for watching.